For more than 100 years, the American Geophysical Union has been opening pathways to discovery, opening a wider understanding of climate change, and opening the fields of science to be more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. 2023 is the year of open science. AGU 2023 is the year of wide open science, and the AGU TV is back again, bringing it straight to you. Hello, and welcome to San Francisco. I'm Laura Krantz, your host of AGU TV, and all this week we will be focusing on AGU's commitment to being a united community grounded in wide open science. Each year, the AGU brings together more than 25,000 attendees from 100 different countries to inspire, engage, and collaborate. Today, as we talk one-on-one -on -one with some of AGU's incredible leaders, we will explore this year's theme of wide open science and how that idea supports AGU's overarching values and beliefs. And buckle up. Today, we take a tour around the globe to showcase the organizations, companies, and institutions that are at the forefront of advancing Earth and space sciences. Our first day is full of fascinating content, and we have plenty of ways for you to watch. You can find the latest AGU TV episode on the TVs placed throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the AGU website, and on our YouTube channel and on X, formerly known as Twitter. We get started today with AGU CEO and Interim Executive Director Janice Lachance here today to discuss this year's theme and where the future of AGU is headed. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. What does AGU's 2023 theme, Wide Open Science, mean to you? For me, Wide Open Science is a global effort to increase participation in science and access to scientific research for people and communities everywhere. And AGU is proud to be a leader in this effort. We open science through our publications, through our extensive work in community science, through policy engagement, and through meetings just like this one. AGU has brought together 25,000 people from nearly 100 countries here to San Francisco and online through our hybrid meeting capabilities to share research, to meet colleagues, and make new friends and to keep growing the ideals of open science together as a community. Open science practices are how we grow a bigger tent for the scientific community, and AGU is creating that culture of change. You can see it in our publications. So far, 12 of AGU's 24 journals are fully open access, including our newly launched journal on machine learning and computation, a field where equitable access to research is crucial to scientific advancements. You can see it in AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange, our community science initiative that is celebrating a decade of service this year. In those last 10 years, Thriving Earth has launched more than 250 projects around the world, creating partnerships to connect communities with scientists to address their community priorities. For example, we recently connected a scientist with a community in Corpus Christi, Texas, that was deeply concerned about the effect a nearby refinery was having on the soil and air in their neighborhoods. The scientist listened carefully to the community's concerns and created a fieldwork plan to test the soil in parks and community gardens to give the Corpus Christi community the best information to make decisions about their land and to work with policymakers to make needed changes. And researchers like this one now have a place to publish all of this important work. 
The Community Science Exchange is a fantastic partnership with several of our scientific society friends that features the Community Science Journal, as well as a multimedia hub to share resources about doing the actual work about community science. Through all of these efforts, AGU continues to open science to make it accessible and equitable for all. We hope our community is as excited as we are to celebrate wide open science this year at AGU 23. What are some of AGU's biggest accomplishments in 2023? We are really proud of AGU's reach into the global community. Our Global Engagement Committee is outstanding. It's made up of passionate and committed members from every region of the world. They help us ensure that AGU is building partnerships and connections to extend the reach of our science in all of the places it's needed most. This year, our leadership has been invited to present at key scientific conferences from Vienna to Singapore, Panama City to Tokyo. Building these relationships and partnerships has been key to expanding the scientific reach of our members and their important work. AGU was also honored to have a delegation at COP28 this year, just days ahead of our annual meeting. It was our third time as COP joining our colleagues at the Ocean Pavilion from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. It's at events like these where decisions are made that will have world-changing impact. Those decisions by our government leaders must be based on rigorous and ethical scientific research. And as the largest association of Earth and space scientists, AGU has the world's leading experts in climate science research, and AGU journals are widely cited in IPCC and other climate reports. That, to me, makes it AGU's obligations for our science and our scientists to be represented at the table where these decisions are being made. And not only is the science itself important, but what's also important is creating good science. We've been very proud this year to present our work on the ethical framework for climate intervention research and experimentation and deployment. As climate change takes its toll on our communities, more and more people are turning to alternative solutions to address this impact. We believe strongly that any climate intervention research should be guided by an ethical framework. So we've convened a global committee of experts in climate science, human rights, policy, ethics, and technology to create a first draft of these principles informed by public comment. We've spent this year meeting with government leaders and communities around the world to discuss the ethical framework and we're so excited to build on this initial work. What is AGU doing to support the next generation of scientists? AGU's work really doesn't mean much unless we have the support and enable the next generation of scientists and leaders. AGU's Mentoring 365 program is one of our efforts that does just that. Mentoring 365 is a virtual platform that matches students and early career professionals with experts in the earth and space sciences anywhere in the world so that they can exchange ideas, create connections, and build a more inclusive community. We've also expanded our AGU Bridge Program Network, which develops inclusive practices for recruiting, admitting, and retaining students from historically marginalized identities in STEM graduate programs. Our first student recruited through the Bridge Program a few years ago graduated just this year. We know that this next generation of scientists are deeply committed to DEI principles, and we see them and hear them and are actively working together to create programs which power these issues. 
In fact, we are incredibly proud to have the very first cohort graduate this year from AGU's Landing Program, which stands for Leadership Academy and Network for Diversity and Inclusion in the Geosciences, our NSF-funded initiative to develop DEI champions. These champions took on year-long projects to advance DEI principles and actions within their own organizations, and they're here at AGU 23 to present the results of those projects. I hope all of you here in San Francisco find our landing graduates to congratulate them and learn something from the amazing work they've done. Janice, we certainly appreciate all your time today and all your work this past year. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to talk with you, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you this week at AGU 23. From NASA to NOAA, here are some of the incredible organizations and institutions breaking new ground on everything from climate change to mapping the ocean floor. Let's take a look. In the early 1940s, people started to understand that the sun can affect the earth in quite profound ways. What became HAO was the place where we had the first ever operating coronagraph. Here at HAO, we do science that goes from the center of the sun all the way into the Earth's atmosphere. And then, because we're part of NCAR, we actually extend that down to the Earth. So we go from the sun to the mud. We study the interior of the sun, the sun's atmosphere, the solar wind, the Earth's magnetic field, and the space environment associated with that, and then also the upper atmosphere of the Earth. The National Center for Atmospheric Research is a federally funded research and development center for the NSF where I work at the High Altitude Observatory, HAO, uh, we have an observatory, the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory, so we provide observations. As we as a society get more reliant on technology, we also are more impacted by solar weather. And so being able to predict will help us reduce the economic loss and also protect our lives as we become a more space-faring civilization. The Hawaii Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities and my research program are committed to transformational efforts that rebuild resilience, health and equity in Hawaii's agroecosystems. By working directly with Hawaii producers and practitioners, we make sure that we are pursuing an equitable work and that our work is grounded on the needs of the people of Hawaii. Through our innovative and contemporary uh, approach to science that interweaves both Western and indigenous knowledge pathways, we hope to create a transformed system that acknowledges Hawaii's unique ecological and cultural context. Our partnership is striving for metrics of success in areas of increased local food production and meaningful climate benefits of sequestration in addition to more holistic views of uh, social equity and improved resilience in food system. The Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute is a consortium of five institutional affiliates and together we work with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration to develop new technology, conduct exploration, and educate and train the next generation of ocean explorers and blue economy workers. A relatively small amount of the world's ocean has been explored. Only about 24% has been mapped to any degree of resolution. Around the US, around our exclusive economic zone, only 50% has been mapped. The ocean provides countless benefits to the planet, the nation and the people who live around it. We're all impacted by the ocean. And through ocean exploration, we can provide new insights on how the ocean affects our lives. We critically rely on the ocean and having as much information about it is what the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute is trying to provide. The Environmental Institute at the University of Virginia is a hub of interdisciplinary research, training, and partnerships that are focused on connecting our research with policy and practice. The mission of the Institute is to build and 
support teams that can address some of these grand challenges that we have as a society that are related to environmental change and climate. Climate change is one of the most existential threats to society and to our future. I really think that it's this need is incredibly urgent and that that's why I'm excited about bringing the research out into communities who need the research. And I think in the end it's about, you know, real communities and real people that climate change is real, but so are the solutions. NASA's Open Science Initiative is really an incredible opportunity for more people to um, interact with NASA's incredible scientific data. Um, it's really about including more people in the scientific process, opening that process so it's more transparent, and really, really enabling um, people that traditionally haven't worked within NASA to be able to work with the information that we collect. We follow the open science principle from the start, right? We did everything in the open. But when we released the foundation model in the Hugging Face, which is the open repository of uh, AI models and data sets, we immediately saw community picking it up and developing their own applications. The proliferation of these models and data set following the open science principles, I think that was our in initial goal, and I think we've succeeded in that. The Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, which I'll call CW3E, was created to help address challenges with Western water management because we have such big extremes in wet and dry. One of the big challenges for California and the West Coast in managing water is that a ton of it comes in just a few storms each year. Those storms are atmospheric rivers and they form over the Pacific and there's usually not as much measurements as we have for storms over the continent. That is the purpose of atmospheric river reconnaissance, is to capture, measure, and feed that into the forecast models to better predict atmospheric river landfall on the West Coast. In coming here 10 years ago from a federal agency and starting a center at a university, one of the goals was to explore how to educate a new generation of young people in the possibilities that science creates to make the world a better place. The mission of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics began as studying from space the Earth's atmosphere, near-Earth space, and the Sun. Over time, our mission has evolved to be studying the planets in our solar system. CUTE is the Colorado Ultraviolet Transit Experiment. It's also actually small and cute, and it really had two purposes. One, to see if we could actually use a small spacecraft to do really fundamental science. Um, and then a second, we wanted to understand more about the atmospheres of these hot Jupiters. It took time for us to actually wait for CUTE to observe over those several hours of time and then get the data down and then process it and then try to look for the signal there. But once we saw the, the signal, it was like a sigh of relief. It was, oh, thank goodness it's working. It was, my gosh, finally, we have data that nobody else has seen before. Our hands-on training is, uh, is among the most powerful and maybe in some ways the most unique aspect of education here at the university. GALANT stands for Glasgow as a Living Lab Accelerating Novel Transformation and it's a research program that's funded by the Natural Environmental Research Council in the UK. It's aimed at helping the city become more climate resilient and achieve its net zero targets. Being able to partner with a dedicated group of academics, bringing us research, expertise and knowledge to our policy making process to make sure that that policy making process is rooted in evidence, and that it's going to have the impact and the outcomes that we want it to have, that was so valuable. How do we come up with solutions that are beneficial for the environment? for people and health and are equitable and how do we also fold the economy into that? We are really focused on using that investment and that intervention to deliver net zero to improve the well-being of Glasgow's citizens. Pyre Create is an international project that focuses both on the research and education related to climate change in the Americas and we're looking at how climate varied in the past. 
Our partners in Brazil, for example, are experts in speleothem research. So they look at stalagmites and extract signals of past climate variability from caves. Our partners in Argentina are experts in tree ring research. So they help us to understand how climate has varied in the past on very high frequency timescales. I think it's very important to learn about what's happening with past climates because these will have impacts on how we live and how our societies and how our ecosystems function. The ability to look deep back in time and understand how the climates varied over the last 1,000 years creates a much better sense of the true natural variability of the climate system. And based on our understanding of the past, we know that the climate we see now is something that we've never seen before, and we really do live in a new climate era. America U is a nationally organized, university-based, and state-implemented program that focuses on Earth observation and remote sensing through applied research, education, outreach, workforce development, and technology transfer. We work across 41 different states across the United States, and each one of our states are called state views. And each one of those state views has an opportunity to focus on local issues, address educational needs, and identify different types of opportunities where we can use remote sensing and earth observation to address local issues and support education. America View is, is helping our students understand how they can make a change from the local scale that scales up to the state that potentially could impact something on a national or even global scale, that, that making a difference in taking this, this technology that they've learned, the data that they're using, to be able to, to affect change, often working in a very local environment, but understanding how they fit in the bigger picture. Ultimately, America View is creating partnerships and opportunities to empower Earth observation and train the next generation of remote sensing scientists and educators. Inclusiveness is essential for addressing the scientific and societal challenges that face humanity and our planet. Joining us now to talk about the AGU's ongoing efforts is AGU President Lisa Gromlich. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Laura. It's really great to be here with you. What does AGU's 2023 theme, Wide Open Science, mean to you? I love this theme this year, Wide Open Science. You know, often I say Earth and Space Sciences is the teamiest of team science. And to me, the wide open science theme completely supports that assertion. So what is wide open science? To me, it is global engagement for two reasons. One is for the purpose of research, as well as ensuring that our results are not just usable but used, particularly when we think about access to research and research results for communities that have historically been excluded from science. Why wide open science? Well, two things. It accelerates discovery and it ensures that the benefits for all people are optimized. So let's think about wide open science. How do we actually do this? How does AGU as a professional association deliver on this promise, on this aspiration of wide open science? There's a couple of key things. The bedrock of our work is, of course, peer-reviewed publications. And recall, we've got 23 journals. And at this point, 12 of the 23 journals are open access. Half of the articles published by AGU are open to the entire public on the moment in which they're published. Now, this comes with a changing business model for publication, and I want to make sure people understand that, yes, there are page charges, and there are waivers and discounts and other funding options. Never let the fees associated with open access stop you from submitting and publishing in an AGU journal. What else does it mean? Well, something that is newer for us than our decades and decades of publications is the Thriving Earth Exchange. Thriving Earth Exchange is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. It is a way in which our scientists engage with communities to co-create, to work hand in hand with those communities 
to define research questions that are relevant to the community and ensure that the community then can use those research results to enact better policies, to create better practices, and to alert people to the kinds of environmental issues that they may be facing. I'm really proud of the Thriving Earth Exchange. It has grown to over 250 programs. We started in the United States, but it has gone global. Well, and then lastly, when we think about wide open science, we can just simply think about the meeting we're at right now. There are over 25,000 people attending, either virtually or in person here in San Francisco. People are coming from over 100 different countries. And it's a time in which we actually put into practice wide open science. And if we're to look back at 2023, what are some of AGU's biggest accomplishments? The work we're doing on the ethical framework for climate intervention, research, experimentation, and deployment. What's that about? As climate change and the climate crisis becomes more and more pressing for us, we are looking for solutions that at times could involve major interventions in the climate system, like geoengineering or carbon dioxide removal and storage and big scale technologies where investments are being made. And the question is, who makes the decision about which investments are made and how they are deployed and what kind of research underlies those decisions? We have assembled a global committee of experts in this area. And once again, global in its scope. And it's not just the scientists. It's policymakers, it's ethicists, it's people that are very attuned to the role of technology in society. And we are working together to create a framework of principles that would govern experimentation, research, and deployment. I'm very proud of the work here. To me, it is another part of wide open science where we are thinking about the complete impact of the way in which our science is deployed, either now or potentially in the future, around the world. One of the things that's particularly meaning for me is that I have been working with AGU senior staff to ensure that we have a presence globally I just got back from the 60th anniversary of the Indian Geophysical Union, a wonderful meeting held in India where the science that was presenting was so exciting, super sophisticated work, and the number of young early career and student researchers that presented and were honored by the IGU was incredible. So, the, to me, our accomplishments have been not only kind of doing our business as usual of publications and fabulous meetings, but ensuring that we really are creating and engaging with a global community of scientists and practitioners around the world. What is AGU doing to support the next generation of scientists? Well, when I think about the next generation of scientists, I actually have to hearken back when I was part of that next generation of scientists and what AGU meant to me. So indulge me in a quick story, and I'm sure some of the early career people can relate to this. There's the thrill of getting your first big grant. For me, it was an NSF grant to work with Chinese colleagues up on the Tibetan Plateau. And I had a couple of days of elation, and then a couple of very, very hard weeks of realizing that there were ways that this very early collaboration with Chinese colleagues had all sorts of complications. And as an early career person, frankly, I didn't quite know what I was doing. I turned to people like Dr. Lonnie Thompson, who of course had decades of work in this area, and I knew him through AGU. And I could not have had the success I had had it not been for my AGU network of people that were senior scientists but very willing to help me as an early career person. I hope for all of you early career people listening to this video that you, you take my example seriously and when you find yourself in that place where you really don't quite know how you're going to pull off the ambitious thing that you aspire to, that you turn to more senior people knowing that this is what this community is all about. So 
what are we, as an organization, what are we doing? I am very proud of our publication, EAS, and the way in which we not only publish research summaries, but we're really about trying to make sure people can have careers that are fulfilling. So look back, just a couple of issues ago, there was an entire issue devoted to the wide variety of careers that Earth and Space Sciences, training in the Earth and Space Sciences can lead you towards. Um, I mentioned earlier about mentoring. That, I was on some level just lucky to be able to connect with Dr. Lonnie Thompson. We now have a way through Mentoring 365, our virtual year-round mentoring program, that if you have a question, it could be a small technical question or it could be some career questions you have that might need a sort of longer enduring engagement, we can connect you with a mentor. And this is a worldwide program because it's virtual. And I hope you'll look into that. Once again, small questions, big questions, everything in between we can work with. I think an important part for the next generation of scientists is the degree to which we are taking diversity, equity, and inclusion seriously as a cultural issue. And with our NSF-funded project landing, we are creating opportunities for culture change champions, and I'm very excited about those programs. Be sure and check those out. So while you're here at AGU 23, I urge you to, you've got to go to your scientific sessions, of course, and you're going to meet with colleagues, but please, please, please take advantage of the wide variety of opportunities we have. Everything from like getting a headshot to you know, talking with people about publication opportunities. Do engage with the full range of benefits you have from being an AGU member. Thank you, Lisa, for making time to be with us today. I hope the week ahead is a great one. It's been a pleasure. That does it for our first day of AGU TV. We are thrilled to have you joining us this week as we dive into what wide open science means and how it benefits all of us. You can find the latest AGU TV episode on the TVs placed throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the AGU website, and on our YouTube channel and on X, formerly known as Twitter. Thanks for joining us today. We will be right back here tomorrow with all new interviews and segments. Stay tuned.